After more than a year of investigation, a thousand witnesses, and nine televised hearings, the January 6th committee has summed up its case. What is abundantly clear is that the now twice impeached former president incited a mob to storm the U.S. Capitol, and together they came this close to overturning the election that had gone against him. The only reason the disgraced former president and his allies didn't succeed is because of a combination of laws that were in place, courts that did their job, and a literal handful of people who acted in good faith to stop him. And one of those people is Judge Michael Ludig. Judge Ludig is a former federal appeals court judge. He was at his home in Vail, Colorado, eating dinner with his wife on January the 4th, 2021, when he got a phone call from his old friend, Richard Cullen. Cullen, who at the time was serving as outside counsel to then Vice President Mike Pence, called Ludic all the time. That part was normal, but this particular phone call was not. Cullen told Judge Ludic that John Eastman, a former clerk for Ludic, was advising President Trump that Pence had the constitutional authority to block the certification of the electors and overturn the election in Trump's favor. Ludig was shocked to hear that Eastman would suggest such a thing. Ludig respected Eastman as a constitutional scholar, but he told Cullen, quote, look, you can tell the vice president that I said he has no such authority at all, end quote. By early the next morning, January 5th, things had escalated. Ludig got another urgent call from Richard Cullen saying, quote, judge, can you help the vice president? We need you to say something publicly. We need to get your voice out to the country. Ludig was stumped. He was at that point retired. He didn't think he had much of a platform. He remembered thinking, quote, I don't even have a fax machine. Then he remembered that he had opened an account on a social media website called Twitter a few months before, but he had never tweeted. He had no idea how to. So Judge Ludic typed out his statement, looked up how to make a tweet thread, and on January the 5th, he tweeted out a seven-tweet statement. It read in part, quote, the only responsibility and power of the vice president under the Constitution is to faithfully count the electoral college votes as they have been cast. The Constitution does not empower the vice president to alter in any way the votes that have been cast, either by rejecting certain of them or otherwise. And apparently, all Mike Pence needed to do was that. It gave him the, the authority to do the right thing and the lawful thing. Well, we all know what happens next. On Wednesday, January 6th, then VP Pence bucks Donald J. Trump and certifies the election for the rightful winner, Joseph R. Biden. Pence released a statement citing Ludig's legal analysis. And the next day, Judge Ludig was sitting in his car outside a UPS store in Vail, Colorado, when he got a call from an unlisted number. It was Vice President Mike Pence calling to thank him. He may not have known how meaningful his first set of tweets ever were going to be, but Judge Michael Ludic gave Mike Pence the legal cover to defy Donald Trump and refuse to overturn the election. This action alone may have saved democracy for the moment. When John Eastman suggested that Pence had the power to subvert the election and throw out the disputed electoral votes, Eastman referenced something called the Electoral Count Act. You've heard about it before. Judge Ludig, in his advice to Mike Pence, refuted Eastman's misguided reading of the Electoral Count Act. But that wasn't the only tactic that Trump and his allies tried to use to remain in office. They also attempted to exploit vague language in a fringe concept known as the Independent State Legislature Theory, ISL for short. Remember ISL, because you're going to hear it a few times in the next few minutes. Extreme interpretations of the ISL doctrine argue that state legislatures have the absolute power to set election rules and to determine disputed outcomes. It would give elected state representatives the authority to redraw districts without oversight, to handpick electors, and even ignore their own state's voting laws and constitutions. Behind the scenes, Trump's allies argued that this ISL theory allowed for state legislatures to select electors who would cast their votes for Donald Trump, even though the certified electors were lawfully bound to cast their votes for Joe Biden or for whomever had actually won the popular vote in their state. We now know that their plan didn't work, but American democracy might not be as lucky next time. Because that once fringe independent state legislature theory is now the centerpiece of a Supreme Court case that Judge Michael Ludig calls the most important case for American democracy in the almost two and a half centuries since America's founding. 
In the case, Moore v. Harper, the plaintiffs used the ISL theory to argue that there should be no checks or balances for state legislatures in elections, not even the courts. Now, if that had been the case in December 2020, Donald Trump may have gotten away with overturning the election that he did not win. In a recent piece in The Atlantic that you must read, Judge Ludig argues that there is absolutely nothing to support the independent state legislature theory. He says, quote, such a doctrine would be antithetical to the framer's intent and to the text, fundamental design and architecture of the Constitution. I spoke to Judge Michael Ludig about all of this and how it plays into the future of America. I know you're getting going with your day, but I'm going to ask you to stop what you're doing for the next 10 minutes, to sit down and maybe even take some notes, because what you're about to hear is a lot, but it's incredibly important to understand just how close to democracy and how close our democracy came to collapse and how to stop it from happening again. Judge Ludic, thank you for being with us this morning. We really appreciate your time. Good morning, Ali. It's a pleasure to be on with you today. Thank you for inviting me. I hope we've done some justice to the story, but it's, it's deeply complicated. Um, and, and there are sort of two things at play here, and I want to talk about both of them. Since March of this year, you've been working with a group of bipartisan elected officials to write the Electoral Count Reform Act of 2022. You call it um, something that has to happen to prevent another January 6th. The changes in it, by the way, include clarifying the vice president's role in the process, as well as raising the threshold for elected officials to object to the results of elections. And in a New York Times op-ed, you argue that shoring up protections around the electoral process should actually be in line with conservative values, which you hold. In fact, I'm going to quote from you. You say the future of our democracy depends on reform of the Electoral Count Act. The only members in Congress who might not want to reform this menacing law are those planning its imminent, imminent exploitation to overturn the next presidential election. Judge, this sounds like a no-brainer. And by the way, it's, it's not just bipartisan. It includes people from across the political spectrum. Most people think the Electoral Count Act needs to be fixed and should be fixed. Uh, Ali, that's correct. The, uh, uh, the effort to overturn the 2020 uh, presidential election was multifaceted, uh, and it entailed the exploitation of, of, of not only the Constitution, but a number of laws of the United States. One of those laws was, as you say, uh, the Electoral Count Act of, of 1887. Uh, th that act, uh, actually gives Congress uh, the authority to uh, decide the presidency in a number of, of uh, circumstances uh, where uh, the framers would have never intended for uh, Congress to play a role uh, at all. Uh, so uh, I do believe that that uh, reform of the Electoral Count Act is, is one of the reforms that are uh, that is necessary in order to prevent uh, another uh, January 6th. And I remember talking to you about this back in May, and, and you made that point very clear. You, you were very worried that people would take Electoral uh, Count Act reform and feel that it was done, that it's the, it's the bare minimum people can do, which is why you are so interested in, in looking ahead to this upcoming Supreme Court case, Moore v. Harper, uh, which some legal scholars have expressed concern that if the Supreme Court embraces the independent state legislature theory, states could circumvent protections that are actually laid out in the Electoral Count Reform Act. Tell me a bit about that. The, the independent state uh, legislature uh, theory of constitutional interpretation, Allie, uh, was the centerpiece of, of the effort to, to overturn uh, the 2020 presidential election. Uh, long before the, the election itself, uh, the former president and his allies uh, were arguing in the, the lower federal courts and eventually uh, in the Supreme Court of the United States uh, that there, uh, there was such a, a theory uh, or doctrine of constitutional interpretation. Uh, and in, in that context, uh, it would uh, give plenary and exclusive uh, uh, authority uh, in the state legislatures to uh, to select the uh, uh, electors who, who in turn cast their votes uh, for the president and vice president, transmit those votes to Congress, and they're counted on January 6th to determine the, the presidency. The uh, 
the independent state legislature theory, uh, if it applies uh, uh, to the Constitution at all, applies to both the electors clause as well as the elections clause, um, essentially because the, the language of both uh, constitutional provisions uh, is in, in relevant uh, respects uh, identical. So at issue in, in the uh, uh, 2020 presidential election was the uh, ISL as it applies to the electors clause of the Constitution. At issue in, mm -hmm. uh, in, in Moore versus Harper is that theory as it applies to the elections clause of the Constitution. This is a very, very important uh, distinction because one might wonder how these two things are connected. Um, this is about how elections are run, elections are, uh, results are counted, and what decisions legislatures can make. This month, you wrote in The Atlantic about the independent state legislature uh, theory, writing, there's literally no support in the Constitution, the pre-ratification debates, or the history from the time of our nation's founding, or the Constitution's framing for a theory of an independent state legislature that would foreclose state judicial review of state legislatures redistricting decisions, end quote. Now, without asking you to make a prediction of the Supreme Court's decision, how concerned are you that this court may be prepared to embrace what you have described as a fringe concept, the independent state legislature theory? Well, no one uh, can read the tea leaves uh, on a Supreme Court uh, decision, Ali. Uh, but uh, the, the genesis of, of this theory uh, was in, in a concurrence uh, authored by then Chief Justice uh, uh, William Rehnquist, joined by then Justices Scalia and Thomas in Bush versus Gore uh, 20 plus years ago. And, and in, in that separate concurrence, they uh, outlined uh, what is today uh, the independent state legislature theory. And the essence of it was that there should be some limit on the uh, state Supreme Court's interpretations of the law of their state laws uh, uh, in order that the state legislatures be permitted to uh, uh, to uh, legislate the redistricting. Uh, so th this theory was didn't come out of nowhere. It was grounded in a concurrence uh, in, in the Supreme Court itself. Now, uh, by December 2020, the Supreme Court had declined to take the case in the context of the 2020 presidential election under the electors clause. But there was no question at that time that uh, that there were at least five justices on the court who, who, would, who we believed would, would have been interested in some uh, uh, variation of the theory. Uh, the only person of the five who had not actually said as much was uh, Justice Amy Coney Barrett, who had just come to the court and uh, did not participate in the, the court's decision uh, to, to decline to take those cases then. So if you fast forward to, to today uh, with that same group of, of nine justices on the court, the thinking is that, that there, there are at least five justices who are interested in the theory. Uh, but to your question, uh, none of the justices ha have expressed interest thus far in an uh, in as, as aggressive uh, a version of the uh, independent state legislature theory as is being advanced by the plaintiffs uh, in this case. In this case, as you rightly pointed out, the uh, uh, the uh, plaintiffs are arguing that uh, the state courts and the state supreme courts, in particular, uh, uh, would have no judicial review power over the legislature's uh, uh, redistricting or gerrymandering decisions. That is the most aggressive uh, uh, theory. And that's the one that the plaintiffs in this case is, uh, are arguing for. 
Now, as to my prediction, I, I don't make any prediction, but as, as I outlined in the, uh, the Atlantic article, th there is literally, literally nothing at all uh, in the Constitution or in, in the, the, the history, uh, uh, either from the time of the founding of our country uh, or the framing of the Constitution, uh, that even hints at the possibility uh, of such a theory. The only argument at all uh, is simply that because the election clause uh, uh, empowers the state legislatures to prescribe the manner of holding uh, the congressional elections, that therefore the state courts have no role whatsoever. Uh, that's not tenable under uh, any of the, the normal uh, uh, tools of constitutional interpretation. Uh, and I don't, uh, for one, believe that the court will ever embrace that particular version of the theory. Judge, we have a lot of smart conversations on this show, and uh, this may be one of the smartest. I'm glad that our viewers have had uh, the ability to get a bit of a taste of a conversation that you and I have had in the past, and I hope uh, we can make this a, a more regular thing because the future of this country itself and democracy is at stake. Judge Michael Ludick is a former federal judge for the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit. I will remind you that during his 15-year tenure as a federal appeals judge, he earned a reputation as one of the most conservative judges in the country.